thank, thank you all. It's, a, it's really a, a great honor, especially to talk in front of the commoners and to learn so much from you all today. And so I hope this will be, um, you know, apropos of that, uh, will be a generative part of the discussion. I'm going to jump right in. I'm talking from Plot on Black Spatial Insurgency. Leaving Ocho Rios, we head into the mountains and the country, passing through Fern Gully, a lush green tint that encompasses the road's edges with ferns and a plethora of other tropical plants, as well as large overhanging trees. We are heading to the home place of my partner's grandmother and mother, a well-kept home with land in rural St. Mary Parish, Jamaica. My partner's family introduces me to this place through their memories and stories of it. As we traverse further into the mountains, along the winding roads that extend away from the north coast into the interior, I grow in awe of the distinctive microclimates and vegetation through which we pass. At some point after the forest and a series of cow farms and other places that my partner and his family point out along the way, the sweeping green of, the sweeping green of grass fields, ruin it, and forest are sometimes broken up by groupings of papayas, breadfruit, banana, ginger, yam, various vegetables, and coffee. In some places, the cultivation of these plants represents the vestiges of commercial farming, bananas still growing despite the loss of a processing plant long since abandoned following shifts in the geography of global crop production. Many farms remain cultivating foodstuffs for local markets, local truck markets. We see a cabbage truck along the way coming down likely selling to wholesalers in bigger towns and cities on the coast, if not for export. Many of these cultivated plants, however, are set in small parcels of land adjoining homes and offer residents a cornucopia overhanging their aluminum rooftops and spreading out into the small parcels of land that surround their homes. After three trips into the country, including a journey to Bob Marley's birthplace at Nine Mile, I come to identify breadfruit in particular, breadfruit trees in particular, as places where houses are likely. Even when I can't see a house because an old structure has given way, or for some houses because they are hidden behind a verdant wall as we wind through the mountainous topography. Breadfruits hanging over people's homes, along with fruit trees, vegetable plots, chicken coops, and other evidence of small-scale food self-reliance, suggest to me, at least as an outsider, Jamaica's enduring alternative modalities of cultivation and stewardship against the backdrop of the land tenure regime that evolved after slavery. I'm indebted to Sylvia Winter's theorization of the plot and its genealogy in the context of the Caribbean and specifically Jamaica for helping to elucidate social spatial relations translated from rural to urban communities, particularly in relation to black communities in the US context. The plot's reorganization is as a living logic a hybridized cultural praxis with capacity for incremental and radical transformation, translation, and translocation prompted by intercommunal dynamics and their expression in dialogue, uh, in dialogic relation with the forces that impinge upon black placemaking from outside. Neither breadfruit, nor banana, nor many of the other plants that Jamaicans cultivate in their yards are indigenous to the region. Africans transplanted aki, banana, chocolate, plantains, and yam. Colonists brought breadfruit from the Pacific. However, it is in the partial indigenization of these plants in excess of the logics and organization of mass production and profitability that interests me as a point of connection and departure. Around the African diaspora, the plot and similar localized traditions serve as formations of basic food autonomy reflecting hybrid maroon and indigenous genealogies of cultivation, intimate through opposition with, but not predetermined by the boom and bust cycling of settlement, extractivism, racial capitalist cultivation, ecocide, and disposal. This everyday practice of baseline food resilience and self-sufficiency resonates across the, the Atlantic and in the South African context as part, of a, um, as part of a forthcoming zine uh, project, which I'm just giving you a couple of images from, not necessarily tied to what I'm saying, um, but as part of a forthcoming zine project centering black ecologies, the other editors, Hugh Wayne Watson, Justin Hosby, and the artist Elisa Diamond, and I have included an interview with an organization, Ujama, um, located in a township just outside Cape Town, South Africa, 
which has implemented a program of what they call guerrilla gardening in any available space within the township to underscore that, quote, food is free and to raise consciousness about the pitfalls of a commodified food system depending on petrochemicals, enclosed land, and the basic lack of nutritional self-determination for black communities residing in post-apartheid townships. These modes, noting again my limited and, limited and incomplete encounters with them through visiting and with reading about them from the perspective of community organizers, suggest important models for, for ensuring survival and abundance in my own home community where the spray and poison system currently feeds chickens and capitalists while endangering the people, destroying the soil, decimating the hydrological system, and casting the future of rural life, even under green horizons, as sacrificial and unlivable within the geographies of disposability. Food, as Wendy, Marshall, Wendy Marshall's critical ethnographic research underscores, integrates us together and with a wider ecology and has the power to sustain intimacy, kinship, and well-being despite the enduring harm of conquest. Our current U.S. food system, as well as other industrial systems networked through global markets and distribution, represent the plantation enclosures, legacies of toxic stewardship exported across a vast emporium, including within the settler-controlled territory of the U.S. itself, and blowing back through the sinews of the Green Revolution and warfare securitized agriculture. Bioprospecting, ongoing genocidal land seizures, oil wars, and violent re-territorializations of infrastructures through the extension of the mining plantation extractive complex continue to drive the denaturing of land and waterscapes and the sundering of human relations to the specificity of place, unmaking the delicate relations of the biome and of living from Puerto Rico to Virginia and Vanuatu. In the context of my own home community and our, and our ongoing vulnerability um, and disposability, even within horizons of the green transition, I've been working in recent months uh, with an organization, Just Harvest, to imagine, practice, and build and sustain an alternative food system for Essex County and surrounding communities in Virginia beginning through political education and practical gardening information, as well as a planned communal garden with a desire to create a wider network of reciprocal exchanges, reconstituting community outside capitalist markets, germane to indigenous and black modes of inhabitants and collectivity. What Ujama and the quotidian practices I witness in Jamaica suggest is the use of the interstices of property to feed ourselves and each other and what that suggests is, for me, is the kind of enduring possibilities of using the land for cultivating intimacies and mutuality, generative dependencies through cultivation, immersion, and intimacy in spite of the pattern of extraction and discardability at the heart of gender, racial, capitalist geographies that shape the diaspora. So from there, I want to turn um, just very briefly, because I know we're uh, a little behind, um, to just given a, a bit actually from the, the beginning of Dark Agoras um, and really thinking about rural, uh, a rural kind of commons um, through the paradigm of what I call and have called plotting the black commons. So I want to start, um, and this really underwrites, as you'll see as I move through this, um, the kind of opening of Dark Agoras, which um, again follows the kind of and traces the kind of ways that rural imaginaries and practices of, of land, alternative land use in the context of slavery and post-emancipation life, the ways that black communities trans, um, transfer and, trans, um, and, and, um, and translate that to the urban context. So I'm hoping to, to have something to say both to folks who are interested in rural and urban commons. So I'm gonna start with um, thinking a bit about slavery. Um, it's quite important to note that in the context of Virginia, and um, the plantation system across the kind of um, Virginia into the Caribbean and most of the Americas, that starvation is an everyday um, part of the discipline of, of the plantation. Um, and that's, that's um, heightened by sort of the use of glut and feasting actually to violently uh, reinforce and underscore the day-to-day -day ways in which starvation is used. So for example, you can think about in the context of um, Christmas feasts in Virginia are, are pretty um, infamous in slave narratives and other narratives um, about that period because 
um, you know, everyone is pretty much hungry on a regular basis. You get to Christmas, they they stuff you with food and with liquor. And then on January 1st is like the rent and sale day. Like people are sold from their families a week later, right? Um, people are stolen from each other a week later. So I wanted to just start with hog stealing. Um, hog, and, and I'm not sure that's necessarily a terminology that is resonant in this context, but pigs, right? <laughs> Poor. Um, you know, I, um, so this is from my own home county in Essex County, Virginia, in 1765. I just want to note Harry and Will and Flora and Tom um, both receive, um, both, both pairs receive over 30 um, lashes in the public square for so-called hog stealing. So in this context, um, it should also be noted in addition to what I said about starvation, that um, hogs and cattle are pretty much feral in Virginia in this period. Unlike, um, it, unlike the UK context in this point, at this point where, um, where animals are kind of contained, at, um, in Virginia, quite conversely, uh, animals have replaced the kind of natural uh, flora and fauna um, and, and run wild. And yet, even if you're caught having stolen a hog that's running free in the woods, it's punishable. The next punishment after this, and there are examples of that, include nailing ears to, ears to the pillory and having your ears cut off uh, is the third. Um, and I, I would imagine if you get to four, they kill you, right? Um, so even in that, so in that context, I'm really interested in this kind of fugitive commensality that black communities are engaged in. Of course, the, the archive, the court records that, that bear that only catch, only um, demonstrate the repression of it. But the reality is that these communities continue to share food and that that's an important and vital part of how they create um, black social life and worlds in which um, uh, enslavement and the violence of that is only supposed to create atomization and and all of that. <clears throat> I want to uh, move on to just thinking about the ways in which this kind of fugitive commensality works in the context of um, the uh, a tradition of of um, breaking the rules and anti-discipline in the context of slavery. So Elizabeth Sparks, um, this is quite a bit later in the antebellum period in the 19th century. Um, this is an enslaved person who's interviewed in the 1930s um, and who was a child under the, in the context of slavery. Sometimes they beat you so bad, they, they just couldn't stand it, and they ran away to the woods. If you got in the woods, they couldn't get you. You could hide and people slip you something to eat. Once in a while, they was free, there was free Negroes who come from somewhere. They could come see you if you was their folks. Negroes used to go way off in the quarters and slip and have meetings. They called it stealing the meeting. Number one, I want to point out um, this, just this idea of stealing the meeting. That's, I think, something that we could all uh, like take, take um, uh, heart around. Um, and just the kind of insurgent um, geographic practices that happen under the, un, in the context of the plantation enclosures. I think it's also quite important to note um, the relationship between this kind of um, the marronage or runaways and the people who slip them food, each, each are equally punishable by violence, right? Um, in, the, in the kind of context of the historiography of, of slave resistance, um, folks have tended to emphasize the maroon as a, a set-apart figure, the runaway as the kind of figure who um, is a more, uh, is a better kind of um, resistant subject. But they rely on these folks, primarily, I would argue, pri primarily women and elders, right, who are actually doing the growing of this food that they then slip to these other folks. So I'm just trying to get a, to get a sense of the ways in which enslaved people um, rearticulate the kinds of um, rearticulate the kinds of care, labor, and other stuff that they're, that's downloaded onto them as a responsibility, and create insurgent forms and spatial practices out of it. Um, Charles Crawley, um, another enslaved person in this region, when slaves ran away, they were brought back to their master or missus. When they couldn't catch them, they didn't bother but let them go. Sometimes the slaves would go and take up and live in, uh, at other places. Some of them lived in the woods off of taking things such as hogs, corn, and vegetables from other folks' farms. Well, if these slaves was caught, they were sold by their new masters to go down south. They tell me their masters down south were so mean to slaves that they would uh, let them work them cotton fields till they fall dead with holes in their hands and would beat them. And I'll show you in a bit um, this kind of um, violent 
removal of, of enslaved people to the Deep South in a second, just to help contextualize this. But I, again, I want to note that hogs and corn and vegetables that enslaved people are um, growing and cultivating in the context of, of the plantation, that they're using that as a, a form of resistance um, that connects those who stay on plantations and, and are visible to masters and overseers and those who are in the woods, like that's a continuity in a, in a community. In some ways we could think about that as it, in some ways is resonant with a foot in and a foot out, right? Having that kind of relation. Um, I also want to note, um, actually I'm going to um, keep it in the interest of time. James L. Smith, a self-published narrative in 1880. One night I went crabbing and was up most of the night. A boy accompanied me. We caught a large mess of crabs and took them home with us. The next day I had a card for one of the women to spin. And being up all night, I could hardly keep my eyes open. Every once in a while I would fall asleep. So here we can get a sense of the ways in which this responsibility for feeding yourself in the context of plantations slips into, um, uh, into, the, into actions, collective actions, that actually pull at the discipline of labor in the context of the plantation. So, um, so while, while uh, enslaved children and all enslaved people are being starved to death and, and have to grow food by night in gardens or go fishing or hunting at night, um, that, that leads them actually to have a more subversive relationship in, um, in relation to um, the discipline of, of time and, and place in relation to plantation ecologies. James V. Dean, another 1937 WPA narrative, my choice food was fish and crabs cooked in styles by my mother. Dean is um, an enslaved person, uh, as an enslaved person lived at, on the, along the Potomac um, in Maryland. Um, and I want to note that this is, it may seem just like a passing reference, my mom, right? If anyone has ever read Frederick Douglass's narrative from this same region, Douglass notes that he only met his mother three times by night, right? And Douglass analyzes that as a part of the fact that um, enslaved children are stripped of their mother, the relationship to their mothers from very young so that it's easier later in life to sell them without have them having formed kind of intimate bonds with kin. So in this context, saying that I am, am engaged with, you know, first of all, that I remember my mother, that I remember I can actually hold on to something that she prepared and I can still, you know, I taste it, right? And also I want to talk about, um, just mention the ways that this is, in, in, um, is intimately connected with a larger land and waterscape, right? Nothing that enslaved people have any formal legal claim over, right? And that's what I mean by the black commons. It's not a it's not a guaranteed relation, even when there is a commons, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a second, even when there is a kind of formal legal commons, black communities are radically excluded from that under slavery and post-emancipation life. So these kind of fugitive relationships to uh, water and landscapes are not given for enslaved people, even as, um, as they kind of must engage in those places and, and practice, uh, practice visions of those places um, that, um, that uh, exceed the plantation and its kind of extractive logics. Um, I want to just show how these kinds of things go into direct um, subversion of, of land and waterscapes in this context through an interview given by many folks, also in 37, um, in the Virginia context. She's interviewed in Petersburg, Virginia. She describes a, quote, great big iron pot put at the door that slaves used to dampen the sounds of their worship and to prevent capture by the old paddy rollers or slave catchers who would come and horsewhip every last one of them just because those poor souls were praying to God to free them from their awful bondage. Folks also recalled the worshipers, quote, tying grapevines and other vines across the road. Then when, uh, when the paddy rollers come gallanting with their horses, running so fast you could see them vines would tangle them up and cause the horses to stumble and fall. And lots of times, badly, they would break their legs and the horses too. One interval, one old poor devil got tangled, so, and the horse kept a carrying him till he fell off the horse and the next day, that sucker was found in the road with them vines was wound around his neck so many times. Yes, had choked him, they said. He was totally dead. Serves them right because them old white folks treated us so mean. And in the con I want to note that in the, even in the context of the 1930s, 
for an elder black woman being interviewed in Virginia to say, <laughs> at another point she says, I hope the creeks rise and kill all the white people, right? Like she, see, she sees a very different relationship to ecologies and geographies here that are born of this plot imaginary. And they're not always in direct confrontation with slave mastery because that would be a certain death in many contexts. But it, it, um, it, there's a cultural context in which these kind of subversive forms and the black commons um, underwrite the possibilities of black social life. I want to turn very quickly to, and I hope you can see this, just to think about the con contextualizing this in the kind of enclosure of the plantations. Um, so this is a black population change, 1800 to 1810. And um, what you could, in the, the lightest tan colors are the greatest population gain for, so for enslaved Africans. Um, the lightest blue is the uh, greatest population loss. So you can already see that um, 1810 to 18, I mean 1800 to 1810, black communities are being displaced from like at least small segments of the tide water here um, and South Carolina into what's the upcountry, right? Um, that's because plantations have, a, especially in Virginia, but also in the Carolinas, have an avaricious relationship to the soil. Tobacco kills the soil in a, in a, in a generation. So this, um, this enclosure is being driven by the fact that the kind of ecological um, relationship of the plantation is totally extractive and, and it creates a regime of disposability for land and people, right? So this is a population change, 1820 to 1830. You could see in this context, um, the, the re-territorialization through the Trail of Tears that's happened just prior to, in, um, just prior to this period. Um, transforming the kind of um, what had been um, Cherokee and Choctaw and other indigenous people's land into plantation ecologies, primarily using enslaved labor to clear all of that land, right? And to plant cotton, as we'll see. This is the top of the antebellum period, right before the Civil War, 20 years before the Civil War, 1830, 1840. You can see what those enslaved people that I just um, pointed to are talking about. Anyone who's of a certain um, of a certain age, of certain able body, is sold to the deep south in this period. Du Bois note, notes, for example, that um, the the plantations in the upper south become pla uh, breeder plantations, right? Where literally the profitability of slavery is the sale of of slave children and young people to the deep south, to the cotton and sugar regions that are emerging in this these new rounds of genocidal enclosure that that happen in this in this area. Um, 20 or 30 percent of slaves come through the Chesapeake um, region and, and um, you know, many of them go to through the port of New Orleans. By, the, by in 1860, Richmond, Virginia, and New Orleans are the two biggest ports, um, slave shipping ports in the U.S. And that's because Richmond is shipping out and New Orleans is importing slaves, right? Um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of the kind of um, environmental catastrophe that this, that cotton is um, in this context of what had been indigenous cultivated forests and other landscapes, um, you get the intensification of cotton. This is, the red here is 45 bales of cotton per, per acre. So this is tremendously um, bountiful land that is being consumed and gobbled up um, through the, the plantation enclosures. Um, in this context, I want to just note that enslaved people continue to use the kind of um, social formations that I've discussed in the Virginia context in the Deep South. Donaville Brassad, an enslaved person who's interviewed after slavery in Louisiana, each slave could have their little garden. They raised vegetables and had a couple of beehives for the honey. Again, we might read that as just a kind of, oh, well, they had a garden. But when we go back to the reality that um, that this is the basis not only for um, black social life in this context, but also black insurgencies, black spatial insurgencies. These are the people that are feeding the runaways. These are the people that, you know, Nat Turner, the, the, um, you know, the infamous or famous uh, slave rebellion in 1831 in Virginia, he's not found, he's found in a cave six weeks after the, the unsuccessful slave rebellion. Somebody's feeding him, right? <laughs> like this, this is part of the kind of regime of resistance. Um, I wanna note Charlotte's, Charlotte Brooks, um, her narrative is collected by another black woman in 1890. Most deep south narratives are not, are collected even in, during the WPA by white 
um, interviewers. So this is distinct in the sense that a black woman is interviewing a black woman. Um, Octavia, uh, I mean, Charlotte Brooks notes that she sold from slavery in Virginia at about 14 or 15 years old, as far as she can recall. She's shipped to a sugar plantation in Virginia. I mean, from, uh, from a, uh, like a wheat farm in Virginia to a sugar plantation in Louisiana. She gets there, she's to totally socially isolated, right? Um, her master speaks Creole, she speaks English. Most of the other enslaved people around her don't speak English. Um, they practice Catholicism. She has literally no cultural context for what's happening around her on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. About four years into her enslavement, um, uh, Charlotte Brooks notes that she catches wind through the grapevine, which is another part of the kind of black um, spatial uh, practices that are unsanctioned by masters is this like from plantation to plantation, people give information, right? She hears through the grapevine that about, um, that, that another enslaved woman has just been sold to the neighboring plantation from Virginia. Her, she says in the narrative, like, I thought, let me, um, let me go find out if this, first of all, if this woman is related to me, or second of all, if she knew my mother, right? Remember going back to what we said about um, the, the fragility of, of enslaved folks and their relationships to their parents, um, especially their mothers is, is, you know, made fragile by these, these transformations. When she gets to the other plantation and encounters this woman, they realize they don't have any kinship bonds at all. But what they do know is the kind of... Um, the, the kind of um, small uh, gatherings, especially that were religious in the context of Virginia, through those, they know the same hymns, they, they know the same um, prayers, and so they have a shared um, cultural grammar that allows them to create a new kind of world um, displaced in Louisiana, and they, they attract other enslaved people to this, right, and they um, do so subversively. Um, she notes a number of times that her master catches them um, having their prayer services and and worship services out in the in the um, out in the cat uh, in the quarters, and you know they narrowly avoid being whipped, right? Um, so I want to. So in the the context of slavery, um, this is I want to suggest that all of these kind of <laughs> Spatial practices constitute a kind of black commons, an unsanctioned relationship to outdoors, to the quarters, to all these sites that are just supposed to be sites of extraction and violence that black communities repurpose and transform and transfigure through these relationships. Um, during, during the U.S. Civil War, of course, um, as Du Bois notes, um, enslaved former slaves faced down murder, force, and anarchy across the war zone and in the so-called contraband camps. Hundred, you know, thousands of people run away um, to the Union side, but of course they face rape and violence and, and food insecurity and all of that in that context as well. And yet I want to I point to, and that's what I'll um, um, talk about for the rest of the time, is the post-emancipation world, um, despite the kind of um, near uprooting of these black practices of place, black communities continue to um, cultivate um, alternative relationships to land and waterscapes. And I want to talk about that um, now in the context of, of post-emancipation. I'm going to skip this slide for a second. Um, actually, no, I want to talk about in the 1880s and um, 1890s period in Virginia. Um, this is, again, my home community, Essex County, the um, Rappahannock Territory, the Rappahannock Nation, the river is named for uh, the Rappahannocks. Um, this is a public oyster grounds um, that is, is mapped in the 1890s by the state of Virginia. Um, it's important to note that in this context that, um, that these, river, these waterways during the Civil War are weaponized, right? Like people, they're blowing boats up. Like, it's not safe to fish these waters um, in this period because this is um, right near Washington, D.C., right? This is, the Potomac is the next river up. Um, from here, which goes to Washington, D.C., from the Chesapeake Bay. So this is the next river down, and it's connected through the same system. Um, the, so the, so in, the, in the context of 1880s and 1890s, there's been nearly a decade or more where no one has really fished in a, in a major way um, these waterways, and suddenly there's a bonanza in these waterways, a, a, a new round of enclosure that's associated with the 1890s, um, where the state of Virginia is seeking to codify oyster grounds, map them so that they can, you know, take what is a 
a complex species and its uh, delicate relationship between land and water, salt and fresh water, and make it into a fishable commodity, right? Into, into oyster grounds. Um, so I, that's the kind of context that I want to talk um, about um, the ways in which black communities continue small scale levels of cultivation in this, in this context um, of these waterways. And let me just note really quickly, this is governed govern through um, the adoption in the US context of, of English common law and through the kind of 1820s or 30s riparian doctrine in the US, all tidal rivers are considered a commons, right? Um, now, that, that again, when it comes to black people, that's a very different relationship because they have no legal rights as, as, that are guaranteed in that way. Um, <clears throat> And in this context, um, I want to just note in the context in which um, the state of Virginia begins to uh, rent riparian land, hundreds of acres at a time, and white, um, white um, oyster workers um, are growing hundreds and hundreds of acres of oyster cultivation um, riverland that black communities, um, partially out of necessity, but partially out of the ongoing ethos of the black commons and the plot, continue to small these to to just cultivate these really small kind of um, these small kind of holdings in this context the the Fauntleroy family um, rents a half an acre in um, from the state of Virginia um, according to the census the family also owns about 20 acres of land um, 10 of which they 10 of which they plant five of which they um, five of which they keep in a, as a meadow or a or an orchard and then five of which they keep as forest land, right? Um, and what? And so this half an acre, like their aquacultural and agricultural small scale practices, are about small scale subsistence, familial well being, and not necessarily the large extractive project um, of 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 what Virginia recast in this period as a kind of extension of the old logics of landed power as oyster planters, right? Which is the apex of this, this hierarchy that emerges in this period. And what, what's important about this is the ways in which black communities use these small scale practices to cultivate alternative formulations of community in place. So I just wanna um, highlight a place called Lit Walton um, that's described here, and I won't read through this, but it's described as a layer of chocolate and a slice of chocolate cake. <laughs> um, and so basically it's these, it's, um, they're, they're the, um, and this is out of a federal study, the so-called oyster Negroes, right? And what's interesting is what uh, the large, um, up against the waterways, let me go back, up against the waterways, the planters still hold on to the, large, the prime land in, in these tidal areas because it's the best land for cultivation. Now, in the back country, black people are increasingly in this period being relegated to, um, to sharecropping and to other kinds of very um, exploitative and extractive forms. There's this, they talk about the lit Walter Negroes in the early 20th century are these folks who are able to, to basically create a sliver of land that they own and control that's between those two, that's sandwiched between those two pieces. Um, where black folks are able to cultivate their own social worlds. They build churches, they buy homes, they build small businesses. They create a kind of um, a world within a world, even in a, uh, despite the kinds of um, repression and violence that they face increasingly after the 1890s um, coincided with the institution of Jim Crow, right? Um, I just want to point to the ways that this helps to cultivate a whole black world. Um, so the Gloucester Letter is a newspaper that's associated um, with the first black high school um, in the 18, um, 1889, founded in 1889 um, in this, in this um, same region. This is the first, um, so Virginia makes no provision um, until the 1940s for black secondary education. So black community, it, it, um, and this is the editor of the, um, of the Gloucester Letter who was also the principal of that at this first school says, basically after this emancipation celebration on January the 1st, that um, we didn't get as much money as we wanted this year for the school building fund. And the reason that we didn't is because the oysters weren't good this year. It wasn't a good crop. That's the negative frame, but we can understand that. That means that these little small scale oyster, oystering communities and efforts 
are actually funding a whole black world that includes black educational facilities, black churches, and, and basically the basis of a black social world in a context in which lynching, um, segregation, and economic exploitation continue to be the kind of name of the game. Um, just to show you the ways in which um, this continues into, um, into the 20th century, I wanted to show you another, the, the second school, and this one is um, in my home community in Essex, or was uh, the Rappahannock Industrial Academy, which is at Ozina, um, also an oystering community um, in, in the same area. Um, Ozina, I think, is like around here. Um, this is Bola, so it must be like a little bit further, actually. No, a little bit closer. Let me see if that's the, no, it's not on here. But Ozina is, is, on, is near oystering, um, oystering grounds and um and so black communities in in Essex County go ahead they also create a um create a a secondary school um and what I want to note about these are these kind of um lists where basically um black women are cl very clearly cultivating their own patches of land and how they're sustaining the school is through these pantry drives with you know a, a quarter oyster, I mean, um, uh, uh, two quarts of preserved fruit, um, you know, beans, all these kind of things. That the plot continues to be the kind of un the the material relation of the plot and Black Commons, even in the context of post emancipation life, continues to underwrite um, Black possibility. It's critical because these these are this school hosts a number of like agri um, Black agriculturalist discussions. Um, and it extends into places like Philadelphia, the alumni association after the Great Migration. There's alumni associations in northern urban cities that are noted in black newspapers as being connected to these places. So it's not just this hyper local, um, you know, one county thing like these networks that build out from these kinds of institutional spaces. They are um, underwriting a whole they're underwriting black life in a context in which black people are could still consider disposable right um, and viol viable um, despite all of that however this um, and I, it's important to note that these um, these relationships of alternatives that I'm talking about they precede and exceed Jim Crow but they do evolve in di dialogue with Jim Crow as well and I want to just note that the Jim Crow enclosure is real. So Carter G. Woodson, a famous um, uh, black historian, um, first black historian with a PhD from Harvard, um, Virginia born and raised, notes that in the 1920s, in his 1930 book, The Rural Negro, notes that in the 1920s, black people were increasingly, quote, turned away from the bathing beach, which was once a free for all swimming place not admitted to the private game reserve, which occupied the old fishing and hunting grounds and prohibited from having, quote, any parties on the Placid Lake where they once rode their canoes without fear of disturbance. Um, and what I'm, what, what we're, I mean, here Woodson is literally just noting an enclosure, right? But particularly an anti-black enclosure, because many of these spaces, as he goes on to note, they do go on, they're, they're going to be white exclusive leisure sites of, of white leisure. Um, and just in the context of Essex County, this is the same period um, where Thomas Washington is lynched in an oystering community, um, and and just just a reign of terror over Black life in this in, in the Jim Crow South through sexual violence, murder, chain gangs, and others other means of basically recapturing Black life um, for the aims of of um, confining it. In the context of the book, I think about the ways that this moves forward into the twenty. 20th century through practices of black place in the interest of time I'm going to um, I'll just say just very quickly um, I, I think about Father Divine I think about a range of institutions in the book that include spaces of the economic and social underground what's considered disreputable and also um, organizations and, and groups that are considered um, to either be uh, kind of haplessly religious and or um, and, and or in this context even cultish to think about um, what black disreputable forms of black life might actually tell us about um, working class black place and the ways that black communities in the great migration translated the imaginaries of the plot and all of that into the context of, the, of, of cities. I think about how that evolves 
um, through the 1964 riot um, and also through into the 1970s with black power through the organization MOVE and others in particularly in Philadelphia that continue, I think, to hold on to a kind of ethos around place that emphasizes youth value, that de-emphasizes growth, um, and that challenges kind of key tenets of um, key tenets of the kind of urban regime that emerges, especially after 1940. Um, one that suggests that that black people either need to be removed from the city or that they need to be contained and enclosed within a city. Um, and and uh, as we see, that comes to Negroes with guns, right? <laughs> to play on uh, Robert F. Williams' uh, metaphor. Um, I end the book uh, with thinking about the 21st century in Philadelphia, where many of these kind of insurgent spaces of black life have been displaced through gentrification and the emergence of real estate investment trusts, large scale re-territorialization. Um, so for example, the, the CEO of Brandywine uh, Trust, which, um, which owns this property in Philadelphia, um, the first on the West Bank of the school, um, on the West Bank of the Schuylkill, um, the first skyscraper on the West Bank of the Schuylkill, um, or major um, non-governmental skyscraper on, on the West Bank of the Schuylkill. Um, you know, Brandywine Trust in, in um, 1990s has $5 million worth of property. Now they have $5 billion worth of property. So we can see the kind of um, expropriative, violent real estate regime that is a global one. Um, they own millions of a square, square feet of property that extend from Philadelphia to Texas and probably internationally as well if we really start picking apart their portfolio. Um, and also th this man is a kind of shadow mayor. The CEO, last I checked, all the kind of parks in central Philadelphia have been privatized. He's he is bo he's the board chair of all of those. <laughs> so they have a, a private security firm. I mean, we can see all the ways that this is horrible. Um, but I, it continues to, I, what I'm getting at is it continues to evolve um, in a kind of repressive relationship um, with the plot and the black commons. I want to end actually by turning towards a new project um, and just read from June Jordan to think about the ways that the plot continues to um, inhabit black feminist visions and black power visions. Um, in particular, I want to think about um, June Jordan's, uh, 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 she wrote a draft, she drafted a, her second novel um, in, 19, in the 1970s after a trip to Mississippi where she met Fannie Lou Hamer and others. Um, and Jordan, um, Jordan is not, her parentage is not black U.S., but actually Caribbean. And so I'm interested in what, um, what it means that she sees Mississippi as the future. Um, and I'll just read this because it speaks for itself and then I'll get out of y'all's way. Um, so the controlling intellectual background. And OK Now was never published. The publisher, it, uh, um, she had a contract for a book. She submitted this book. They were like, girl, bye. We are not, <laughs> we aren't doing that. Um, what, no, what, her first publisher asked her, what, basically, who are you to do um, anything about land reform? Who are you? Um, as a poet, as a writer, you don't know anything. Even though she had won the Rome Prize in design and, and was, was friends with Buck Mr. Fuller, they were like, girl, we don't know you. So um, I'll just read this and, and then hush. We must learn to share the earth while there is still time to try. Among other things, this means that whenever private property rights conflict with absolute human need, these rights shall be modified or eliminated. My thesis is that America has more than enough, more than enough power and natural and fabricated resources to make this nation a haven for all of its people. And America possesses more than enough power and genocidal precedent and tendency and suicidal obeisance to the industrial values of efficiency, increasing product to destroy the earth now and forever. It is neither right nor necessary that our common resources, including those of the federal government, function in an unequal, unbalanced manner so as to guarantee the privation and deba debasement of millions of Americans and their children. We are not helpless here in Mississippi, America. We can rescue the center city community of Brownsville, which is in Brooklyn, so uh, urban community, we can rescue the center city community of Brownsville and the town of Ruralville, Mississippi, where Fannie Lou Hamer was a rural Mississippi town, as surely and as easily as we can rescue the Lockheed Corporation. Of course, the Lockheed Corporation is a major bomb and, and weapons generator. Within America and abroad, thinking peoples are terrified that moral government in the United States is a child's chimera, and they have 
and they have come to accept that we are defeated a priori if we hope for proof that this country can instigate and sustain dramatic, radical political and economic change simply because human life is at stake. Stopping the hunger, ending the systems of gut and spiritual starvation in Ruleville, Mississippi, America will demonstrate our capacity for radical right action. It will unify the desperate, the furious, and the stolid, black and white. It will create a rural alternative to urban failure for the currently poor and the young and the success-exhausted middle age. It will block the intolerable abuse of our finite resources of land and our finite resources of existing particular lives. For all these reasons, the hungering must be stopped. Land reform should take place in Mississippi, America, and it can happen. OK Now will show why the new life associated with land reform is necessary, wanted, and also how it is possible. So I'll stop there. Thank you.